Hello. Hi. Hear me okay? Yes, very clear. Yep, great. I will grab my slides and crack on. See the slides? Come on. Yes. Maybe a little bit laggy, yep. but we'll see. Yep. Cool. Okay. Take it away. Um, and do I need to maximize that as well? Or you, uh, it's on display that? mode. It looks it looks right. I think. My, okay, good. Yep. Um, so morning everyone, uh, or morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. So thanks for everyone for tuning in and, and special thanks to James and Paula for organizing the workshop for the invite and for being very, very generous in the scheduling, at least genuine, generous to people in my time zone. Um, Cause I know you guys are burning the midnight oil over there. So uh, my name is John Griffiths. I'm talking to you from Toronto uh, where the sun is shining brightly in the morning. And I'd like to share with you some recent work from myself and my group studying the physiological effects of non-invasive brain stimulation using EEG and mathematical modeling techniques. Um, before I get into the details of the, the specific data and the models that we've been using, I want to talk briefly a little bit about the general research line that we're pursuing in my group and in our institute more broadly. Um, so I'm, I'm leading one of around eight core teams in a brand new research institute in Toronto called the Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics. Um, so Casey and I is housed in a, in a large psychiatric hospital in downtown Toronto called the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, um, just on the edge of the U of T campus. And uh, we're a new outfit. We actually, as you can see there, we just had our first year anniversary just a, a few weeks ago, but uh, growing rapidly. And one of the, so as I said, we're, we're housed in a psychiatric hospital. And one of the key things that we're really trying to push forward as a center is um, accelerating the rate at which new techniques and discoveries in basic science make it into the clinic. So, and specifically in terms of the basic science, the a key focus for us as a center is multi-scale computational neuroscience. Uh, and with the, so there are a few people at the, at the conference who are working in different kind of corners of that domain. Um, I, I'm working, as I said, on uh, whole brain modeling and the specific focus of a lot of my work at the moment is on non-invasive brain stimulation. So non-invasive brain stimulation or NIBS is it's a really fascinating, I'm really drawn to this field um, scientifically because it's a really fascinating collection of interlocking problems. We have uh, problems in terms of the, the physics and the biophysics of, um, you know, so if we take TMS for example, um, which is what I'll be talking about in this talk as well, the, the question of what what is the uh, structure and spatial distribution of the of the electrical and it, so the magnetic and induced electrical fields that are applied for a given coil design and coil orientation and for the specific the specifics of an individual person and patient's brain structure you know skull brain white matter gray matter all of these things really contribute to um, what the what the brain is experiencing in terms of the specific stimulation effects at a macro scale and also at a micro scale at the level of individual neurons um, we need to know and understand we need to understand better to be honest the uh, the way in which electrical and magnetic fields are um, the transfer function if you like from a, an applied electrical and magnetic field to a neuron and to a neural population and that scales up to the type of macro scale things that we've been talking about here um, so far. The second you know primary re uh, area of interesting questions I would say is, is in the area of brain network so when you, after we have, we've applied stimulation to a certain site and let's say we've characterized the the, the um, the first part of the picture there well, then we want to know, okay, what are the downstream effects? What are the large scale brain wide influences of applying stimulation at a given brain location? And this is really a question about connectivity. So it's a question of characterizing the anatomical connectivity structure and the way in which uh, macro scale, large scale network dynamics of the kind that we've heard from most of the speakers already today, those result from dynamic operations on a large scale brain graph. The third key area is plasticity. Um, in my my 
you know, personal sketch of the problem space here. And from a, from a clinical point of view, this is probably the most important because this is the type of thing that is, if anything, is mediating the long-term therapeutic effects of non-invasive brain stimulation, then at some level it's a plasticity phenomenon because the long-term um, long changes resulting from some, uh, some uh, you know, therapeutic course of uh, applied repetitive brain stimulation. And we can, that, we can ask this at, uh, again, I say a, a macro physiological state level and also at a more micro level of the physiology and the ion channel kinetics and so on of, um, of the plasticity mechanisms at the, at the neurotransmitter level. And then finally, and this really encompasses all of the above, is the, the clinical uh, applications and utility of, of all of these, these points that I've laid out here. You know? So we want to know with our e-field modeling and our, space, our estimates of the impact of stimulation on cortical tissue, uh, what, is the, what is the best way to do that from a clinical point of view? How do we maximize dosage, which is one of the big ideas in this space, thinking about stimulation in terms of dosage in the same way that you think about um, pharmacologically. Uh, similarly with, with network targeting, you know, can, can we target, can we identify the, the macro scale networks that we want to target to achieve uh, optimal clinical outcomes, and likewise, can we can we maximize plasticity mechanisms that we um, hopefully can improve the efficacy of um, TMS as it's used in the clinic? So this is this is the general space. There's a poster from a new postdoc in my group, very bright new postdoc, Neda Kababand, um, on Sunday, which was more dealing with this second question of network structure and propagation of perturb per like single pulse perturbations. In this talk, I'm going to talk to you about something that's more in this third category, which is long-term changes induced by um, repetitive RTMS. So here's the, here's the plan. I'm going to go over, there's two parts. First part, I'm going to um, show you some new results with some uh, clinical, from a clinical study on major depressive disorder, um, studying EEG responses to RTMS. And then the second part, which is really the emphasis with respect to this workshop is how we're trying to unpack and understand these results in terms of um, in terms of the physiological mechanisms that are underlying some of the rhythmic um, the rhythmic circuits that are generating EEG signals. Okay, so first up, this is a this is collaborative work, and uh, I want to give people their dues here. And uh, in particular, I want to highlight Jonathan uh, Danner and Peter Fettis. Jonathan's a psychiatrist, a clinician scientist in Toronto, and he leads one of the two main TMS depression clinics in the city. Um, and the data that I've been, uh, that I'll be showing you shortly is coming from his group. And in particular, it was mostly analyzed and collected by Peter Fettis. Uh, so, so thanks very much to those two and to the broader collaboration team who are working on this project. So just to kind of give a bit of motivational background, to people who aren't so familiar with this area, major depressive disorder, depression, major depressive disorder is, is a quite widely, um, it's quite a um, common and and in many cases acute uh, mental health disorder that is affects millions of people worldwide. Around around about seventy percent of patients, ha are, they respond well to. Um, drugs to pharmacological medication to antidepressants, that le which is great. Um, that but that leaves uh, around about thirty percent who who are classified as treatment resistant. Typically, when they've failed to respond to two or more different um, rounds of antidepressant medication, and for those patients, new option, more options are needed. And one of the key options is um, brain stimulation, and RTMS is one of the one of the primary therapeutic protocols that are used for for patients who have treatment resistant depression. So the the typical um, the, the the typical procedure with clinical RTMS is uh, uh, ten hertz RTMS over the dorsal left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's the site that was originally studied by Mark George in the '90s, and it's really kind of propagated through. Um, but there's a lot of interest as well in other target other potential target sites and particularly from my collaborators here in Toronto and the and also trying to kind of customize the choice of target according to symptomatologies. 
so this is this is work that's ongoing but uh, i want to give a nod to this because the the data that i'm going to show you is from a non-standard target site and also a non-standard stimulation frequency is one hertz orbiter frontal rtms um because these patients didn't respond to the standard deal pfc target first time round. so here's the Here's a study. So just as a design, we have uh, patients coming in, they, uh, as I said, treatment resistant depression patients. And then first thing that happens is we have uh, EEG and MRI. I'm just going to be talking, about, talking to you about the EEG here. And then they undergo uh, 15 days of either active or sham RTMS and then crossover to the opposite. And we have EEG. We also had an EEG collected in the middle. I'm not going to show you that, but we have EEG at the end. So the, the key thing that we're looking at here is the resting state EEG patterns from this data collection before 30 days RTMS and, well, 15 days RTMS, but over 30 days and after the the therapeutic course. So that's what we're looking at in terms of data. Um, now, on the empirical side, what the first thing we want to know is, is this effective in terms of the patient's um, symptoms and straight, straightforward answer is it is. <clears throat> The, the blue bars and the blue uh, histogram here is the Hamilton Depression Scale score, which is a um, standard score for um, depression symptoms. So that goes down at, the, at both a group level and at mostly an individual level. So basically the three patients who are on the left-hand side of zero here, this is the delta of the pre-post. So these patients, these three patients unfortunately got worse but everyone else on the right-hand side of zero here improved and, and many of them improved a lot. Now, the key result here in terms of the EEG is what I'm showing you here, just focus here on the, so this is channel averaged um, resting state EEG paraspectra. And uh, again, it's, so it's pre post the, um, the RTMS treatment. Um, and the, the principal difference here is suppression of alpha power. Um, which is highly significant at the channel average level and also highly significant at the individual channel level. So this is a, a two sample t-test, paired t-test, um, comparing different average power in, in uh, canonical frequency bands. So we have basically this global alpha suppression effect resulting from one, one hertz orbit, right orbital frontal RTMS, which is basically corresponds to about here in the EEG topography at the front. At the front, just on the right, but mostly in the middle. Okay. So we'll be coming back to this figure a little bit in, in a bit. Um, one other final point on the on this EEG data is that there's also a relationship between the, the al this alpha suppression and the improvement that I showed you in the depression scores. And that's what these data are showing you here. The color score here and the same with the previous one, I should have said is the, the, uh, the, the color map is a, is a T statistic. In this case, it's from a regression with the with the, the delta of the, the improvement in depression scores and the the white dots are channels that showed statistically significant effects. So again, we've got right, it's a right frontal application. So this kind of makes sense for the place where we would be seeing responses that are related to the improvement in symptoms. Uh, and this is just zooming in and plotting the, the data that corresponds to those effects. So I'm, I'm whizzing through this because I want to focus on the models and we started a little bit late, um, but the, that's our kind of key empirical data. So now we want to understand this from the point of view of, um, of neurophysiology. And the, the approach that we've taken to this is to use a fairly widely used and widely studied neurophysiological model of um, EG rhythms that is developed by Peter Robinson and colleagues over the last 20 years or so, with some big contributions from James and Paula amongst other people. Um, and uh, I want to say just first up, because this is something that people kind of gripe about. That um, there are this is this is one model. This is what embeds a certain theory of the you know, cortico, corticothalamic or cortical rhythmogenesis. There are other models, Lyley model, Janssen rhythm model, that represent somewhat similar but also distinct theories of rhythmic generation. Um, I'm not I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of one versus other model here. But there you go. That's the that's the acknowledgement. Um, so I'll crack on, describe the Robinson model, which is basically you know, pretty much, I think, unarguably the most widely studied model of its kind for EEG rhythmogenesis. Um, so the basic structure, I'll, I'll show a few equations, but I won't go into them too much detail in the interest of time, is uh, this, this uh, 
typical setup that we have in basically all neural mass models or most neural mass models, which uh, and this was also described by Patricio, we just start at this point, which is the signal, this phi, which is, let's say, is a action potential, uh, incoming action potentials for a neural population. We have a, a, a um, synaptic kernel with uh, synaptic rise and decay times, these alphas and betas that give us a smoothed, temporally smoothed dendritic response to incoming inputs. This gives us a, a, a um, somatic membrane voltage, which is then converted instantaneously with a sigmoid function into a population firing rate, and then distributed through the system. In this case, the distribution is via a, um, a damped traveling wave mediated through a Laplacian. You can think about it as a network um, more generally. So that's the basic structure of this model and, and these models of this kind. Uh, shout out to NFT Sim, which is a fantastic library that Paula um, and other people put together a few years ago. Uh, that's specifically for simulating these type of structures, um, but it's quite unique in that it's a PDE neural simulator, which there aren't many of. Uh, and then the other part of the model, which is more relevant for what we're talking about here, is the is the corticothalamic circuit. So the idea here is that we have um, four neural populations, two in the cortex, um, the uh, an excitatory and inhibitory population, excitatory pyramidal cells and inhibitory interneurons, and then two neural populations in the thalamus. Again, one is excitatory, which is the um, relay nucleus, which will um, give a subscript S, and then an inhibitory population, the reticular nucleus, which inhibits the relay nucleus. So we have this corticothalamic circuit where the, the cort cortical neurons can drive both the, the, um, the thalamic populations Reticular nucleus in, inhibits the relay nucleus, and then we have this um, kind of return phase back up to the cortex. Um, and this this circuit generates rhythms. That's that's the point. That's that's what's going on here. Um, and it, it, there's two ways that we can study this from a modeling point of view. One is numerically, so just write out the PDEs or the ODEs, generate time series, and then compute numerical power spectra um, from those, as you would do with data. The second way to approach this is the more theoretically elegant and, to my mind, interesting way, which is to uh, use a um, simplified, modified version of the original full nonlinear PDE model that gives us a, a, an analytic expression for the power spectrum. Um, so I won't go into the, um, the details of the derivation here, but basically, what you get in the end is a, is a set of linear equations that map directly from parameters to a power spectrum. And just coming back to the diagram here, what um, is, is interesting is that when, we, when, when you go through this process of setting spatial and temporal derivatives to zero and replacing the sigmoid with a, with a linear um, slope and so on, what we end up with is um, the the kind of transmission through this corticothalamic circuit can be re rearranged or refactored into some of these what we call loop lumped um, lumped loop gains. So essentially, the the um, the connectivity weights or the gains from some of we can combine the connectivity weights or lump the connectivity weights from certain loops or certain subsets or, or like sub motifs, if you like, in this corticothalamic graph. And it turns out that these uh, loop gains, specifically these three, which are indicated in this circuit uh, with these large lines. So we have, um, there's three of them and they, they really dominate the dynamics. There's the um, excitatory positive corticothalamic loop gain, which is GESC, keep your eyes on this, we're gonna see more of this later. An inhibitory corticothalamic loop gain, it's inhibitory because it goes via the reticular nucleus. So it has this negative feedback component. Then we have a, inhibitory loop within the thalamus as well. Um, okay, so, and there are other parameters that determine uh, some of the features of the power spectrum, particularly the synaptic rise and decay constants and the corticothalamic delays. Um, so finally, on the, on the model structure, this is the, so these three loops that I just talked about, the, the, the um, yeah, the, the, the uh, lumped circuit loops, these actually determine the principal oscillatory regimes of the model. Um, and they can define, be defined, uh, or the model can be reduced down to this three-dimensional space that captures most of the, the phenomenological characteristics, which is just represented here. Um, so the three axes of this space represent the 
um, intracortical, which is the X, the intrathalamic, which is the Z, and the corticothalamic, which is the Y, um, lumped, loop, lumped loop gains, okay? And um, each of these three, uh, and, and the three um, kind of dynamical regimes that we, we that the model exhibits are an alpha regime, uh, so off, oscillating roughly 10 hertz, a theta regime, and a sigma, regi sigma regime. Um, so, and this is just a, a kind of demonstration of this from paper from James that shows, just to be super clear about this, that we have a, a five hertz dominated rhythm here in the, in the blue domain on the left-hand side of the Y in the theta domain, and then a 10 hertz dominated power spectra over here on the right-hand side in the alpha dominated domain. So this is the model. Um, the way that I've been using this model is using it through a toolbox called BrainTrack, which was developed by Ramesh Abhisuria from Peter's group a few years back. And um, the what this tool implements is a Markov chain Monte Carlo estimation of the posterior distribution on the model parameters. So it's quite a sophisticated optimization algorithm. Unfortunately, so I've actually done quite a lot of work with this and people who are interested in using this definitely talk to me because I have a, a bit of insight into what um, how to kind of get it to work uh, in the context that I needed anyway. And one of them is that we need to run it for extremely long time uh, to get robust, consistent results in the parameter estimates. Something like 12 hours on a, on a server um, node with about 15 parallel workers um, through the MATLAB interface, just, just so people know. Okay, so here's the results from the modeling study. So the I showed you the, at the group level the this alpha suppression uh, resulting from RTMS. Um, I'm showing you that now the same thing in some exemplary subjects. So this guy in the middle shows something that's more or less exactly what you saw at the uh, at the group average level, which is nice. Um, and in this case, so I've now added the dotted lines here are the model fits. So the, the thick line is the empirical power spectra for in this case one channel C3. Um, and the dotted line is the model fit. So you can see that the model actually does, uh, I, I'm always kind of stunned with how well the, the model is able to fit power, power spectra. It really can capture a wide variety of different patterns. Um, so so we, we get good fits to the power spectra at the individual subjects and the individual channel level. And then when we look at the, the pre-post difference um, in, uh, so how does the brain stimulation change the physiological system? What we see is that the principal location where we see, again, significant effects, um, cost of corrected, P less than 0 0.01, is uh, in this positive corticothalamic loop parameter and in the rough, roughly the area where this right orbitofrontal RTMS was applied. Um, so this is encouraging. This, this makes sense from what we've seen already, and it makes sense from, um, from where we saw most of the action in the alpha um, changes at the data analysis level as well. So what it does, what, what's going on here is that the the model is basically uh, the 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 RTMS is essentially, essentially it's taking people's brains that are generally somewhere around this alpha regime on the right hand side and pushing them towards zero on the y axis of this state space. And the result of that uh, moving towards zero is suppressing the power in the alpha rhythm which, uh, so this is just showing some individual parameters here, just pre, post, GSE for a number of subjects where you can see this alpha suppression, again, with different structures of the power spectra, but um, the same basic relationship in the, in the parameter differences, which is one of the real powers of this method, actually, is that, you know, it's, it's quite a holistic representation of quite a complex spatial pattern, well, pattern across frequencies but there, it, it, it kind of holistically captures multiple components. You're not just looking at a specific frequency band and thinking about things in isolated fashion in that way. So we, we see this suppression, we see this um, in multiple individual subjects, not necessarily every subject, but it's certainly many subjects and we see it at the group level. Uh, so finally, and this is a final point before I wrap up, um, is how can we, how can we kind of build on this and make connections with this result to what we know in other areas about the impact of this brain stimulation intervention. So one area, one thing that we can think about is, um, is excitability. So one of the key concepts in TMS is 
um, this idea about excitability and one of the um, the definitions or classifications of different RTMS protocols is whether they they are excitatory, quote excitatory or quote inhibitory. And the definition of excitatory inhibitory in this area is typically the amplitude of the motor evoked potential or a TMS evoked potential. But essentially, does applying um, RTMS at a given frequency result in a higher and potentially more um, sustained evoked response or a lower evoked response. If it results in a higher evoked response, then it's excitatory. If it results in a lower evoked response, then it's inhibitory. That's how these terms are used in the field. So, um, so we can ask this in the context of the model as well, because one of the nice things about the uh, this model uh, is that there is an analytic expression for the ERP, the evoked response as well, which I'm plotting here along with the power spectra on the, on the bottom and top rows as a function of uh, decreasing values of the positive corticothalamic loop gain, which was where we where we're getting the action in these model fits. So this is just a kind of qualitative demonstration of what happens when you decrease this parameter, which also decreases the value of y in the x y z space. It pushes you towards the origin, so it suppresses the alpha rhythm. You can see that pretty clearly there, and that that you know makes sense in terms of the results that we saw in the EEG data, but it also um, reduces the amplitude and the, the complexity of the evoke response. And from the system's point of view, this is not at all surprising. It's it's to do with like location to the to a, an instability, and um, it's a very natural way of thinking. But it's a very natural way of making a connection to excitability as defined in the RTMS community, which is somewhat is not necessarily the same as a mathematical definition of an impulse response. The bottom line is the the um, the RTMS that's applied here, which I should emphasize is an inhibitory protocol. So it's one hertz RTMS is been established. Don't need to worry about the details of that, but it's been established to be inhibitory along the definitions that I just gave you. So what we're seeing here is that the model is showing us an, an inhibitory response um, in the parameter changes that we're seeing from our fits to the power spectra. Great, so that's it for the, the talk. This is new work, so it's been a pleasure to present this to you. Um, bottom line is that we, we're seeing uh, from one hertz audible frontal RTMS in depressed patients, we're seeing uh, suppression of alpha. Uh, neurophysiological modeling indicates that the suppression of this excitatory corticothalamic loop gain is the, the likely candidate of this effect. And again, this is this is consistent with the nominally inhibitory effect of this type of RTMS that we've used. So the questions for us going forward with this now is uh, are the following. So firstly, we saw very widespread effects in the alpha range as you know, the first the first um, topper pots that I showed you is like, we're applying TMS in the orbital frontal cortex, but it's really having a global effect. So there's, there's really some network mechanisms here that are mediating this, ultimately some version of plastic response to a around about a month of, um, of therapeutic brain stimulation. So what's going on here at a network level is a key question. Um, and, and, and how does that relate to um, neuroanatomy at the level of networks and at the level of things like the skull and the, the, um, the E fields from the TMS? And coming to the physiology part, so what's, d does this result generalize? So will, will we see this result with the flip side of this? So for example, ex enhancement of alpha for nominally excitatory paradigms. Can we replicate this result for other nominally inhibitory paradigms? There are a few with theta burst stimulation, for example. And finally, something that we're, we're, we're looking into uh, is to more, describe more directly, to kind of bring in a mathematical description of the actual plasticity response, rather than attacking it from a kind of more indirect approach of looking at pre-post. Um, so, so also, I think, pretty critical to unpacking what's going on here physiologically. Superb. Well, again, so thanks, everyone, for listening, uh, especially late in the evening in um, in the Antipodes. Thank you to my collaborators, and um, thanks for listening again. Cool. Thank you, John. Nice talk. Uh, I think, well, 
Paula has a question, but I think it's kind of the last point on your future work. Uh, will you incorporate plasticity in the future to capture the trajectory of excitability that increases and decreases in gains, as in Felix's um, TMS extension of the Robinson formulation? Yep, 100%. Exactly right. Um, we're at it. Um, we're actually we're fortunate we have a, a new grant come in. So I have a student working in the who's going to be joining the lab in the fall studying exactly this. And um, one of the things that we want to know here, I think there's two key things that we want to try and achieve. One is um, I really want to uh, try to tie up the theory experiment cycle in this area. So I think um, try, like designing new TMS protocols based on models um, and trying to design new protocols based on what we think we understand about the physiology that could be better and then testing this and then cycling back um, this is something we want to try and do more of. So that's something that we're going to be trying to do at the level of the, the Fong, Robinson, Wilson plasticity model. Um, and then the second part is actually incorporating the cortocathalamic circuit into that or vice versa, incorporating the plasticity into the, into the rhythmic model, which hasn't been done yet to my knowledge. It's only been done at the level of an EI population. Um, and if, if anyone has any good suggestions or has already started doing that, then please drop me a line because that's going to be, I think, an interesting challenge to try and mix together those two modeling approaches, even though they're like nominally from the same model. Like, I don't know exactly how that's going to look yet. Great question, Paula. Cool. Um, sort of out of time, but I'll ask one quick one as well. Uh, for doing the network effects that you plan to do, will you still do this within the Robinson model? Like, will it be eigenmodes or some other spatial you know, PDEs, or will you be doing more of a network type model? Yeah, well, so both of the above. We're, we've been doing work so far, which I mentioned Neda had a poster, and this is like a, a project that's just getting going, but it's going to be a big emphasis for us. It's modeling TMS EEG, TMS about potential responses. And at the model level, we're kind of trying to break up or separate the the question of the dynamics from the question of the connectivity. So our, our first kind of, our, our first stab at this is to, um, we're in, we want to know if we need to describe more of the thalamic connectivity at a connectome level. I had a paper that's kind of hopefully going to receive positive reviews from its, its on archive that is um, doing a connectome version of a Robinson type neural mass. Um, but it's not interconnecting the thalamic populations, right? So the, uh, there's, there's, I think, an important question about the connectivity structure at the level of the, the thalamus with respect to the cortex, kind of within the thalamus and also kind of if you, diagonally, if you like, from some thalamic regions to uh, dis like distal cortical regions. Um, none of that is accounted for in the Robinson model. Robinson model is like you know, little patches of thalamocortical loops. So, the, so we want to we're, we're looking at the connectivity component of that question, but you know, to your point as well, another thing on the agenda is just to write down a network of Robinson neural masses because I really like the model. I really like all of the theory that exists, um, and that's if, if I have one kind of gripe about neurobiology and even computational neuroscience, uh, it's kind of that there isn't so much building there's a lot of building out laterally but not so much building vertically um so i i really appreciate from you know your work james and and the kind of uh, legacy coming from that group the the building vertically that's happened within that theoretical framework and that's something that i would like to kind of tap into by looking into connectome based robinson unit models for example uh yeah and uh since we're, yeah, one last question as well. Um, how long does the state shift last? Is it possible that the decrease in excitability can be sustained? This is a good question. So the it, it's a long-term change. I mean, okay, we're not measuring longitudinally. We're looking at pre-post um, 30 days of RTMS. But it's it's different to the type of timescales that are generally looked at with um, with plasticity paradigms, because generally with plasticity type paradigms, you're looking at, okay, what happens in the area of up to an hour after 
some some period of brain stimulation. So you're on the, the order of minutes to hours. Here we're on the order of days to weeks, right? So there's a there's it's a sustained effect as far as definitions of plasticity goes. You know, normally they're on the order of minutes to hours, but we haven't looked at months, right? And that's that's the next scale. So that's really the thing about plasticity is there's orders of magnitude of difference. But we're somewhere in the middle. I guess, in terms of the, the the scales. And from that point of view, you could say it's a somewhat sustained effect. Cool. Thanks very much. So now, just after 1 a.m. here, we have the last speaker, is Johan Vandermeer. I will invite on, if I can find him in the list. Yes. Yep, thanks, John.